So hi everyone, uh, please settle down. Uh, so we'll start now. So uh, yeah, welcome to the sponge and duplex session. And we have two talks in this uh, session. First one is uh, understanding the duplex and its security by Bart Manning and uh, Bart is presenting it. So, <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, this is actually the only systemization of knowledge. Uh, um, so, but I will try to then also explain it well because that's the goal of a systemization of knowledge. Um, so I'll first talk about the history of the sponges and the duplexes. So we've seen a couple of times already the sponge, the basic sponge. So what we have is we have a permutation P, a B-bit permutation, think of a 1600-bit permutation, um, and you have a state of 1600 bits. And the state is then split into an inner part and an outer part, the inner part of size C, the capacity, the outer part of size R, the rate. And the idea is that you then absorb the messages block by block, interleads with the permutation, and then you can squeeze R bits at a time. It's a well-known design, and we by now know um, that it's generically secure. So if the permutation is assumed to be random, this construction behaves like a random oracle, up to two to the C over two evaluations of the permutation. And this is a powerful result. This is a result that this construction behaves like a random oracle, and you can use it as such in applications. So a typical application you can do is you can make a PRF out of this. So you can just take the sponge, glue together the key in the plain text, and you've got a PRF. Uh, this trick can then be used to make a MAC function. So if you, have a, if you want a MAC function with, say, a D-bit tag, you can just evaluate the sponge on input of the key in the plain text to get the tag. Um, a key stream generation or um, a stream cipher, you can say we can take a key and a diversifier. We require L bits of output, and that's how you get it. Um, of course, these are all assumed that the key is, is fixed length. So these are well-established results and direct consequences of this indifferentiability of the sponge. Um, however, so far, this is only PRF max stream size. For authenticated encryption, typically we built upon a different primitive, and this different primitive is the duplex. Um, duplex is mostly used for authenticated encryption. Uh, there have been multiple Caesar submissions and NIST lightweight crypto submissions that were based on this duplex design. Um, I would like to show a little bit of the evolution of this key sponge and of this duplex. Um, so the, the earliest idea of the key sponge is currently known the outer key sponge. So you just glue together the key in the plain text, you pad it, and then you squeeze it. This is exactly the sponge on input of the key and the plain text. Uh, currently, we call it the outer key sponge. Uh, at some point, people observed you can also inner key sponge it. So you can put the key not together with plain text, but into the inner part. And the scheme still achieves uh, generic security. And finally, people notice that assuming the permutation is good enough, we can just as well key in the inner part and absorb plain text, not R bits at a time, but B bits at a time. This is known, now known as the full key sponge or full state key sponge. This was an evolution of, of key sponges. Uh, the duplex has seen a similar evolution. Um, and the duplex dates back to 2011. So Bartoni et al. described it in uh, their paper in 2011. 
And the idea is you can kind of see the small sponges evaluated after each other without erasing the state. So you have an initialization. In this case, you just initialize with the zeros. And then you basically evaluate a mini sponge on the state. So one block absorbed, padded, then you permute, and then you output R bits or less. If you need uh, only one bit, you output one bit. So the duplex is in this case a mini sponge, uh, but then you don't throw away and start all over, but you keep the state and you make a new duplex evaluation, new duplex evaluation. And that's the core idea of the, of the duplex. Um, so this is the picture of the unkey duplex. You can also, in this case, talk about the outer key duplex, inner key duplex, and eventually full key duplex. Uh, the outer key duplex puts the key in the outer part. So basically, in this case, we for a moment assume that the key is less than R bits. So you just concatenate it with the first blocks and all the, the plain text bits uh, shift a bit. Um, if the key is larger, then you would do two duplex calls to absorb the key. Um, you can also talk about the inner key sponge and eventually the full key sponge. So full key sponge, a full key duplex, is the guy that takes the key into the initialization and then you absorb B bits at a time with a padding. You absorb the plain text B bits at a time and then you truncate at most R bits. So in this case, we truncate C1 bits, C2 bits at most R bits. Um, this is the, the full key uh, duplex. And there have been three main works that investigated this full key duplex. So the first one was of me, Ray and Nittebach and Visar in 15, then Dame, me, and uh, Gilles Van in, in 2017, and then uh, De Braunig and me in 2019. Um, and there have been quite some evolutions in these three variants. So the first one was um, um, this construction, this play, plain full key duplex. Um, and we derived a, a security bound, a rather a simple uh, security bound. Um, what we have is that if we consider an attacker that makes n primitive queries, so calls to the primitive, so um, the attacker can evaluate the permutations, say, on their own computer n times, and it makes m construction queries, which in this context means m duplex calls, so the attacker can make m duplex calls um, in the system, and on the, their own computer it can make n primitive calls, then the security bound is roughly um, mu times n over 2 to the k, plus m squared over 2 to the c, where mu is some vague term related to the multiplicity. As uh, called the multiplicity is related to m. So this was a result from 2015. And, but, um, and basically what we mean is the scheme is secure, whatever it means. I will come back to this later. If, this main, main, if the security bound is less than 1. Because if the security bound is less than 1, then no attacker can break it. Um, there were some downsides in this design. So the most important one is that multiplicity mu, um, which was this one, the maximum outer collision of the permutation was only known a posteriori. So after the attacker makes the permutation queries, makes the data construction queries, after that we can bound mu. But you cannot put mu in a security bound. So that was kind of an, an oversight. It's not a mistake, but it's kind of a fake uh, oversight. Um, there was also a weird dominating term, mu times n over 2 to the k, but we would expect mu times n over 2 to the n. And there was limited flexibility in modeling the adversarial power, because this one um, basically uh, didn't have multi-user security, blockwise adaptive behavior was not properly captured, that kind of stuff. And this also gave a weaker bound. So in 2017, we developed this version of the duplex, which is an extended version of the duplex, um, which admittedly looks much more complex. Okay, so what do we have? Um, well, we, we have multi-user by design. So we have as initialization, we take the key and some IV, which could be a constant. And the key is not just a key, but a key array. And you take as input a delta, which means you take the delta the key of the scheme. Um, we do full state absorption without padding. So here was this, this weird one zero padding, which always loses a bit. And we do full state absorption without a padding. Um, and we rephase. So a phase in this case was a duplex was absorb, permute, squeeze, absorb, permute, squeeze. And now in 2017, we redefined phasing and we said this is um, permute, squeeze, absorb. 
Okay, so you squeeze only R bits at most and you absorb B bits. Okay, and then there is also a vague thing called this function. This is a flag. It's either true or false. If it's false, then you take this value. If it's true, you take this value. And this flag allows to override the outer part or not. There will be an example later on because this flag is rather um, confusing at first sight. Um, and we proved um, a more complex bound, a more fine-grained security bound. So we can have M and N, the construction complexity, data complexity, and the primitive complexity. Then we separately count the number of initialization calls, a uh, number of initialization calls for a fixed IV, um, and some fake parameters called L, omega, and uh, nu. Nu is related to the multi-collision limit function. It's typically a small constant. Um, but L and omega play an important role in the security bound. So M and uh, we have seen this before. So the M is the total number of duplex calls. N is the number of permutation evaluations. Q is the number of initializations of the duplex. Um, and QIV, number of initializations for a single IV, because the attacker can have different keys. L counts the number of different paths that appear. So what, what an attacker can do is it can evaluate the scheme for a certain key delta IV. It can absorb a certain plain text, and then it ends up in this state. And then it can, for instance, absorb a different plain text. And then it can reinitialize, take the same delta, take the same IV, take the same plain text, but a different plain text in the next duplex. And then you have a single path that leads to two different evaluations of the duplex. The path typically keeps track of what data is absorbed. And if an attacker can repeat the path, so the attacker can keep delta, IV, P the same, it turns out that this gives the attacker additional power. And L counts the number of repeated paths. And omega counts the number of duplex calls with overwriting outer part. These are evaluations where the flag is true, so you get the zero here. I will get back to these examples of these parameters later. Um, but we get is a comparable security bound. Uh, two years later, the Browning and me um, looked at a different version of the duplex. Uh, it's basically the same one. We allow for initially uh, a rotation of the initialization for technical purposes, but it's the same construction. The incentive was to look at leakage resilience, and for that we rephased. So it was not squeeze, absorb, permute. Uh, it was now squeeze, absorb, permute instead of permute, squeeze, absorb, and instead of absorb, permute, squeeze. So we did another rephasing to suit the security analysis. Um, and that allowed us to, to give uh, security in the leaky setting. I will just quickly show the bound. Uh, the point I want to make is that we get the same security bound, but then with uh, leaky terms here. So if lambda bits can leak per permutation evaluation, you get a slight degradation in the bound. But the core idea is that the bound will be uh, the same. Um, so what we see so far is this is the duplex um, we kind of agreed on. <laughs> uh, this is the duplex we kind of agreed on that would be useful. Um, but it's a super versatile scheme, super powerful scheme, but it's not clear what's the point of these rephasings. Um, the flag is often very confusing. Um, and also the security bounds are super complex um, and often hard to understand, often misunderstood even by experts. And it's also unclear how these complex bounds relate to a certain use case. And this paper, this work, it gives a complete explanation of the duplex, basically from the bottom, from nothing. What's the idea of the duplex? How to understand it? What's the rationale be her, behind the phasings, the flag, that kind of stuff? And we give five applications. Um, I will talk a little bit about some of these aspects. So I will just only talk about uh, one use case, if I make it to that. Um, but first, I would like to uh, describe exactly the generalized duplex that we take, uh, which is the same one as before, but again, with another rephasing. I will not explain why, uh, but this is kind of the same result. The same results carry over, but this turned out to be the best way of rephasing it for the certain applications. Um, one thing I want to show now is this application of the flag. So what's the point of this flag? And this example also shows how useful a duplex can be. Um, so what's the flag? The flag is either false or true. If it's false, you take 
the previous value and you feed forward it. Uh, it goes forward and you just add the outer part. If it's true, you take zero and you overwrite the outer part. And a typical use case of this is uh, authenticated encryption. And it turns out that security actually decreases for evaluated with flag true. Okay, so to see a nice example, we can look at a very uh, simplification and extreme simplification of this point wrap authenticated encryption scheme. So for the sake of example, consider an authenticated encryption scheme that takes a key of R bits, a plain text of R bits, it gives an output of R bits and a tag of R bits. And it uses a nonce, I call it U, because the notation was overloaded, of C bits. Um, the typical encryption scheme that you can do here, authenticated encryption, you can say we initialize the key, the state, with the key concatenated with the IV, with the nonce. You, that's the initialization, key concatenated with nonce. Then you make a single duplex call that encrypts the plain text and absorbs it into the state. Um, and then you make a single duplex call that squeezes the tag. That's the simplest way of authenticated encryption because you encrypt the plain text and you authenticate it. And this is a duplex call with flag false. But if you decrypt, if you redraw this to the decryption, you have to absorb the ciphertext and this is a duplex call with flag true. And that's the reason why there is a flag in the duplex. And in this case, an attacker can choose the ciphertext value on its own. Um, so because I'm running out of time, uh, I will skip a little bit the, the security model. Um, the bottom line is that typically we say that a duplex is secure if it behaves like the IXIF, ideal extendable input function, which is an ideal duplex. And the whole idea is that if you have two different duplex evaluations with a same path to a certain duplex, but then a different uh, fork in this path, so every time you have a new path to a certain duplex evaluation, you get a random output. But if you have repeated path, you will get a repeated output. And this IXIF is basically a random oracle in disguise. It's a random oracle that captures this behavior, but behaves randomly for the rest. And we say that the duplex is secure if it behaves like this IXIF. Um, and the security bounds in uh, these papers, they are very complex. Uh, the reason why they're complex is they cover many use cases. So M, N, Q, Q, I, V, L, and Omega, they differ based on the use cases. But in a general bound, this will be a huge bound. The general bound is very huge. But if you go for specific use cases, in many cases, Omega is zero. L can be zero. And then the bound simplifies, simplifies a lot. Um, and in the paper, I describe five use cases, arranging from truncated permutation, the simplest one, where you get the simplest bound, um, most terms cancel out to a slightly more complex one, parallel key stream generation and sequential key stream generation. Um, I will discuss message authentication. So for instance, I will show how the full state key sponge follows from the security of the duplex. Um, I will also look at the mode of the OSCOM PRF and show that the duplex results imply uh, security of the OSCOM PRF. Um, and I will look at authenticated encryption. Uh, where I discuss uh, monkey sponge wrap. A monkey sponge wrap is nothing else than just uh, sponge wrap, um, but then modernized and in the, put in a monkey duplex. Um, and these use cases, they give a complete guide of how you can use this duplex result uh, for many practical applications. Um, I was already afraid I would run out of time, so... Uh, um, yeah, but I cannot do this in a minute, but... Uh, um, so, um, I, I would suggest you to watch this. So I'm going to, I'm not going to do the application. I'm just going to give you the teaser, um, the, the, um, the, so application four is in the body of the slides and after the slides and the supporting material, I give all these applications also in a nice explanation, um, um, how the bounds apply to these use cases. So if you're interested and you don't want to read the entire paper, all the explanations are also in the slides, but the nice thing is that truncated permutation is really easy to capture from the general results. It's getting more and more complex, uh, but the reasoning is typically quite um, nice. Okay, so then <laughs> let me conclude. Uh, 
So the, the, the nice thing of this generalized key duplex is that it's a very versatile construction. I mean, it covers many, many use cases, many uh, um, different use cases ranging from encryption to authentication to authenticated encryption. You can cover more use cases like PRNGs, possibly PBKDFs, whatever. Um, many use cases follow from this generic security result of the duplex. Um, a nice application we've already seen before of the duplex was that the ISAP authenticated encryption scheme followed from the duplex result and uh, the security result of SUX. Um, of course, I want to mention that all results in the paper always only hold if the permutation is random. Um, yes, there's much more in the paper. Um, that was already clear. There's much more explanation on the rationale of the duplex. Uh, I'll discuss in detail the idea of this multi-collision limit function. I will talk about the phasing, the rephasing, uh, more rationale behind the flagging, all these five use cases. Um, and I apply the bounds of Dama et al. and the Browning and me to these use cases. Um, so that's uh, my presentation. So thank you. So thanks for the nice talk. So, and uh, my question is that the how about the tightness of the bound? Yes. So for all use cases, you have a matching tack or um, yeah tightness. Not all of them. It really depends on the use cases. So if I go back to, but uh, um, well, this is for instance the full state key sponge. It's, it's a key sponge Mac. We drive a security bound. You can typically always look at what's the dominating term. And that's in this case, it turns out to be this one. You make a Q initializations, the attacker has any evaluations of the permutation, two to the C. And for this one, there is a matching attack. Um, it's just a very a simple kind of matching attack. You combine uh, primitive and construction queries. Um, not all bounds are uh, tied, but in most cases, the dominating term has a matching attack. Hmm. Thank you. So because we are running out of time. So maybe let's thank the speaker. And if you have any other questions, you can. Uh... Okay, so the next talk is uh, permutation based hashing beyond the birthday bound and uh, by Charlotte Lefebvre and Bart Menink and uh, Charlotte is uh, giving the talk. Like this? Yeah. Okay, thanks. And this works. Yes, okay. Thanks for the introduction. So this is a joint work with Bart Menik, which is about permutation-based hashing beyond the birthday bound. So in his talk, Bart uh, talked in detail about the duplex construction, but in this presentation, we will mainly focus on the sponge construction. A nice feature of the sponge is that it has been proven to be indifferentiable from a random oracle. So indifferentiability is a special type of distinguishing game where the adversary is placed either in the real world or in the ideal world and it can make construction and primitive queries. So in the real world, primitive queries give access to a, a random primitive. Uh, in the case of the sponge, this is a random permutation. And construction queries give access to uh, the construction based on this primitive. So in our case, the sponge based on a random permutation. Now in the ideal world, the sponge is replaced by a random oracle and the permutation by a simulator. The goal of the simulator is to mimic the behavior of a random permutation while at the same time uh, uh, making sure that its answers are matching the one of a random oracle. And the goal is to show that uh, the adversary can distinguish between these two words only with a negligible probability. Well, this is a definition of indifferentiability advantage, which is usually expressed as a function of the number of queries that are granted to the adversary. Now, indifferentiability is a strong security property because it allows to compose with single stage adversaries, therefore to modularize the proof. In particular, indifferentiability implies collision 
second pre-image and pre-image resistance. So going back to the sponge, quickly after its introduction, it has been proven to be indifferentiable from a random oracle with uh, the following bond. Uh, in word, it means that the sponge behaves like a random oracle up to, to the dossier of the two queries. And it was clear from the start that this bound is tight because in two to the C over two queries, this is possible to find collision on the inner part of the states and use a subsequent absorb call to make this uh, collision full state. And full state collision, in their turn, allow uh, among over to make a second pre image or a collision on the digest. So we have a security bond uh, which is tight and uh, there is a matching attack uh, that breaks a concrete security property. So what are we looking for there? Well, this work stems from the following remark. There exists some um, um, applications of kit sponge that uh, achieve security beyond C over two bits. This is the case, for example, of the outer kit sponge, where uh, the key is concatenated with the message, and this is fed into the sponge construction. This is reasonable to assume that the online complexity, so the number of calls to the outer kit sponge, is much lower than the offline complexity, or the number of permutation evaluations. And in that case, uh, the auto kit sponge is secure up to 2 to the C over online complexity permutation queries. And this is possible to uh, push the security even further. For example, uh, the construction underlying ASCOM PRF uh, can achieve C bits of security. And in that case, we have a security strength which is doubled. So what are the consequences of this gap? Well, in the setting where the permutation width is sufficiently large, and even the permutation width of ASCOM is seen large here, um, this is not a big deal because uh, we can use it uh, in the key and the, in the keylet setting and uh, have uh, strong security guarantees. So therefore, in that case, this gap simply suggests that a sponging key application is more secure. So for example, it could be possible to uh, decrease the capacity, so increase the rate. But the situation changes when uh, we consider even smaller permutation. Um, so for example, consider the NIST lightweight crypto finalist elephant. So remember that uh, NIST lightweight crypto competition required an authenticated encryption algorithm and optionally a hash function. And the target security was 112 bits of security, assuming online complexity was at most uh, 2 to the 50. Going back to elephants, it is based on permutation of sizes 160, 176, and 200 bits. And with this, uh, the AE mode of elephant achieved uh, 112 bits of security, even with the uh, smallest of this, these members. However, on the other side, if we uh, consider uh, the sponge with these permutation sizes, then even if we take the largest of these three members, this is not possible to get more than 100 bits of security. Therefore, um, Elephant did not provide a hashing functionality simply because its underlying permutation were too small. Therefore, in this work, uh, we were wondering whether this is possible to beat uh, the birthday bound in the permutation size in, uh, in a construction. So we will target indifferentiability because this is a strong security property. To do this, we had a look at uh, the double block length hashing paradigm. Uh, where the very high level ID is to double the state size and at every compression function step, uh, smartly blend the message absorbed into uh, both states by making two or more uh, primitive calls. This is an example of a double block length hashing construction, a Merkel damgard with a permutation using hero's compression function. Um, and one, uh, one important remark here is that um, the existing uh, double block length hashing constructions that were proven indifferentiable are block cipher based. And in the ideal cipher model, block ciphers can be seen as compressing primitives. They take uh, n plus k bits as input and they produce n bits. Permutations are not compressing primitive, so we cannot really apply the technical tricks uh, that they are using there. So instead, we, have, we rather uh, opted to stick to the sponge construction and uh, double block length hash it. And we ended up with the following construction, the double sponge, because this is simply two sponges that are glued together. And after each absorption, uh, the states are blended together using uh, an MDS matrix. So this MDS matrix interprets the top and the bottom part as element in GF2 uh, to the B. And its expression is relatively simple. So just like for the sponge, the top and the bottom part of the states are split as uh, outer part and inner part. 
Uh, the same message block is absorbed both at the top and at the bottom part, uh, and it's not possible here to absorb a different message block, because then the probability to have a full, uh, collisions, uh, full state collision, will uh, downgrade to a birthday bound in the capacity. Uh, similarly, for squeezing, uh, orbits only are extracted at a time, and it was not possible to absorb also on the bottom part, uh, because uh, the sim our simulator then wouldn't be able to uh, provide consistent answers. So here uh, we have an indifferentiability proof where uh, the top and the bottom part, um, the bo top and bottom permutation are um, assumed to be simple uniformly at random independently. But the proof actually carries over when the same permutation is used uh, for the top and the bottom part, but sacrificing one bit for domain separation. So we prove two C over three bits of security. So more precisely, this uh, indifferentiability bound. And it is beyond the birthday bound in the permutation size. Sorry. Whenever the, can you hear me? Yes, OK. And this is beyond the birthday bound in B when the rate is uh, relatively small compared to the capacity. And it actually matches our initial motivation, which is given a certain permutation size, uh, push as far as possible the uh, maximal level of security achievable. For example, uh, consider a permutation size of 176 bits. Then with this size, this is possible to reach 112 bits of security with a rate of 7. And if we increase the permutation size to 200, then the rate uh, can be increased to 31. So with the double sponge, Elephant is able to uh, provide a hash function uh, that meets needs lightweight crypto, at least with its two largest members. So um, a bit more on the technical side. So uh, our simulator behaves uh, like most uh, existing simulators for iterative construction because it keeps track of the graph construction that is deducible from the, its query history. And whenever a query is made that impacts a node, then the simulator will uh, try its best to uh, provide answers that are uh, matching uh, the one of a random oracle. And consistency is ensures, ensured as long as a certain bad event does not occur. A particularity, a particularity to our case is that the simulator will make sure that there exists no partial edge. In other words, if uh, the adversary makes a query with inputs A top XOR a message block, then at the end of its iteration, the simulator will um, make sure that A bottom XOR the same message block is also decided. And doing this um, is going to simplify the setting, notably in order to ensure that uh, the simulator gives consistent answers. Regarding the computation of the distance, uh, we used uh, the trick of Naito and Ota and introduced an intermediate word where construction query gives access to the double sponge based on the simulator, which is itself based on a random oracle hidden uh, to the adversary. And doing so allows to uh, split uh, the distance. Uh, the first one from ideal to intermediate uh, only focuses on consistency. And we prove that as long as the bad event does not occur, then the two words are, are indistinguishable. We also prove uh, the probability of bad um, that it's upper bounded by around Q 2 to the 3 over 2 to the C. And the second distance, so from intermediate to uh, ideal, uh, real, yeah, real, um, focuses on the quality of randomness of the simulator. Uh, how close to a random permutation is the simulator? And we prove a bound of the same order and as the probability of bad. So now about the tightness of the bound. So with respect to our simulator, uh, there is an attack in 2 to the 2c plus r over 3. And this attack is actually based on a, a variant of uh, one of our bad events that targets the consistency. There is therefore a gap of r over 3 with the security bound. And we think that this is a uh, lossy on the proof side. Uh, moreover, this attack uh, does not carry over to any simulator because it's not guaranteed that it's not possible to um, counter this attack by designing a ad hoc simulator. Uh, but this, is, this simulator looks very complicated and this is not so clear that uh, it has not uh, other weaknesses. So the tightness of the bond with respect to any simulator is an open question. And we also had a look at other security properties, namely collision. And we didn't find an attack which is better than the naive one that used the uh, top and bottom permutation and mixing layer as a black box. So maybe it's possible to uh, improve this attack or prove a dedicated bound uh, better than indifferentiability. So to go. 
oops, to conclude, uh, here uh, we have a double block length uh, soft construction based on the sponge, and uh, it can be secure beyond the birthday bound in the permutation size for uh, certain parameter sizes. And it tells, among other, that this is possible to use a smaller permutation for hashing. And for a few to work, uh, there are, uh, we see two uh, directions. The first one would be to try to close the gap between the security bound and the attacks, or maybe explore alternative constructions that are not necessarily sponge-based. That's it for my talks, and thank you for your attention. Uh, okay. Uh, so I have a quick question about the efficiency of your construction. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you mentioned that uh, in, as compared to a 320-bit uh, permutation-based sponge, mm -hmm. uh, you can use 160-bit uh, permutation in your double sponge and uh, that will give better security. But mm -hmm. how efficient it will be as compared to like just a simple sponge, say? It's uh, worse. Uh, the efficiency is wor le much worse than the one of a plain sponge. If, uh, well, if a big permutation are available, this is always better to use them. Uh, if like it was more efficient, the security bond then would need to be a uh, Q over two to the C. But uh, this is not the case. Here we were really focusing on this theoretical exercise. If you have only at your disposal small permutation, how far can is it possible to push the security beyond half of the permutation? Then do you see any other, like in future work, do you see uh, like some other ways uh, by which we can probably improve the efficiency or like applying, say, some finalization on uh, sponge, something yeah. like that, yeah. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't thought about this, uh, but yeah, I need to think more about it. Sure. So yeah, let's uh, thank the speaker and uh, this ends the session. And I think Christoph will take over now. I think it's, so how does it work? Is it on? Yeah, it's like no.